So we are looking at market failures. We are looking at what happens when our markets are not allocatively efficient. What, hap what causes us to not use our scarce resources to produce what people want the most? So what we're really talking about is the fact that the quantity that's set by the market is not the optimal quantity for society. And so we're looking at these different market failures and how we fix them. How do we get this quantity to be the optimal, socially optimal quantity? So let's just uh, recap, make a quick list. What are the market failures? What problem do they create? How do we fix it? So our first one was public goods. The problem is the, what was the problem? The free rider problem, right? It's non-excludable, so people who don't pay just go along for the free ride which means the quantity set by the market is too low, we're underproduced, and the solution is to pay for it with taxes. So there are no free riders. Everybody pays and everybody can enjoy. The second market failure is common goods. What problem do they create? The tragedy of the commons. And so they are overconsumed. The solution is licenses, quotas, other legislative controls, right? Fish and game, making sure you don't take too much. All right. What's the third market failure? Our third market failure is negative externalities. We're hurting people who are not the buyers or the sellers. So the problem is, oops, is that it's overproduced. The quantity set by the market is too much. We want it to be less because the current quantity hurts people. And what's the solution? Well, we have excise taxes, so we internalize that external cost. Other options are legislative controls quotas on production or pollution, and then we have our cap and trade or our market for secondary permits. The fourth market failure was what? Positive externalities. We help people who are not the buyers or the sellers. So the quantity set by the market is too low, so it's underproduced. How do you get more? Well, you either have the government pay for all of it or part of it. So quasi-public good or subsidy. The fifth market failure we looked at was that of instability in the market. The economy grows too fast and then it shrinks. So that creates inflation, prices go up creates unemployment when the economy contracts. We don't like it that it's this roller coaster ride. So what's the solution? We have fiscal policy. What are the two parts to fiscal policy? Government spending and taxes. And we have monetary policy. That's the Bank of Canada. What are the two parts to that? Interest rates and money supply. Which brings us to market failure number six. And that is the prices in the market are too high or too low. So the ones we've been looking at so far are all really based on the quantity not being the optimal quantity. When we look at market failure number six, what we're saying is that this price set by the market is not the socially optimal price. The price could be too high or the price could be too low. So we're going to look at two solutions to this. So we're going to look at the idea of price ceilings and price floors. Okay, so 
Let's take a look. <clears throat> So sometimes prices set by supply and demand are not socially optimal. Okay, so we could look at housing prices. Okay, well, in 2020, the average rental in Toronto for a one bedroom was $2,000. Okay, 2650 for a two bedroom. That's the highest in Canada. In comparison, that same one bedroom apartment in Calgary is about 1100. In Edmonton, it is 950. Now, these numbers are lower significantly than they were just a couple years ago. Because if we go back 2 years, we were paying over $1000 for a one bedroom uh, rental in Red Deer. Okay? So the prices for housing could be too high, a non-socially optimal price. And by too high, we mean that a price that keeps people out of the market, prevents people from moving into your town and being able to work the jobs in your town because they can't afford a place to live. Sometimes prices in the market are too low. So if we look at unskilled labor, jobs you can do with no previous education or training, right? Again, it's a demand and supply. This time it's a demand for workers and supply of workers setting the wage. Well, if we left it up to the market, those jobs would pay seven to $10 an hour. Can you live off of seven to $10 an hour? No, that's why we have minimum wage, because the price in the market, in this case, we're looking at the price of labor, is too low. And so that's why we have minimum wage. And minimum wage in Alberta as of 2020 is $15 an hour. So the idea here is we're intervening because the price in the market is not optimal. We're setting it to a different number in order to make sure people have the money they need in order to live. So these are price controls. Both price ceilings and price floors are price controls. This is where the government is coming in and saying this price in the market is not the socially optimal. So we're either going to set a minimum price, you can't go below, or a maximum price, you can't go above. So the two price controls we're going to look at are price ceilings and price floors. So let's start with a price ceiling. <coughs> and we'll look at the example of rent control. So perhaps you've heard the term rent control. You've watched Sex in the City or Friends, uh, and they've talked about rent control in New York City. Or uh, you've watched a show that takes place in Toronto where they've also had rent control. And this is where the government is saying the price in the market is not the socially optimal price. So the government's going to intervene by setting a maximum price. So it's a ceiling. Think of it as a you cannot go above it. Okay. So a maximum price. Well, let's think about how we would do a price ceiling. Well, what if we set, so let's say the market for renting an apartment, let's say one bedroom apartment, let's say the market says it should be about 1200 bucks. I think this graph shows it just above that, but let's say about 1200 bucks. If you put your price ceiling up here, remember a price ceiling is a max, you can't go above it. So if we set a max price for renting an apartment at 1600 bucks, what would happen? Well, businesses would be happy because they're making a mint off of their apartment rentals. Households would not because they can't afford it. So here we have a surplus. And whenever there's a surplus, quantity supplied more than quantity demanded, it does what to the price? It pushes it down. And so we'd end up here at equilibrium. A price ceiling is a max. So if we put this max, the ceiling above equilibrium, we just end up at equilibrium anyway. So would this be helpful? Well, the whole point of the price ceiling was that this price 
was too high. So when we do a price ceiling, price ceilings have to be put below equilibrium because it's a max. And if it's a max, you can't go above it. So we can't get up to that equilibrium. We are forced to stay down below it. So price ceilings are going to have to be at prices below that equilibrium or market price because the market price is seen as too high. And what this does is it forces the price down. So if this is our apartment, the market says the price should be 1200 bucks, And we're saying that's too expensive. People can't afford to live in our town. So we're going to set the price ceiling. It's now max price 800 bucks. You can't charge more than $800 to rent an apartment. Well, while this fixes the problem of the price being too high, price ceilings create their own problems. And let's look at why. So first, by putting a max price here, the market can't get to equilibrium. And markets don't like it when they're not at equilibrium. So we're forcing this max price to be 800 bucks. So you can see here our quantity demanded and you can see here our quantity supplied. So we can't reach equilibrium, we have what? A shortage or a surplus? We have a shortage, okay? And we can see on our graph, what is that here? We have about, what's that, about 145 and 80. How big is that shortage? <clears throat> so we have about 65,000 rental properties, 65,000 units that we need, but we don't have. Why? Because at a lower price, businesses are less willing to have rental properties. And in fact, if you look here, this is the number of new rental properties in Ontario. And you can see what happened after they instituted rent control, after they put into effect a price ceiling. Because if you can no longer charge more for your rental property, you'd rather be in a different business. So what happens as we lower the price is that the quantity supplied becomes less than before. Less businesses want to have rental properties, it creates a shortage. Now, the reason I said price ceilings create their own problems is that markets don't like to not be in equilibrium. They are constantly trying to find a way back to equilibrium. So let's think through the impact of rent control or a price ceiling. All right. So let's suppose that in your town, we have instituted a price ceiling and we know that creates a shortage of places to rent. More people want places than are available. So what kind of impact does this have? Well, if you manage an apartment complex, do you want to charge the same price for the penthouse suite as you do for the smaller apartments with no view? No, if you are capped at 800 bucks, you can't charge a premium for those higher end places. So what happens is, is the size of the apartment goes down. The quality of the apartment goes down, right? Because why would I put in a uh, marble and hardwood floors if I can't charge more for them? So might as well just reduce the quality since I can't charge a higher price. Well, how do we make sure that the quality doesn't drop so far that all the apartments are just terrible living conditions and we have a bunch of slumlords? Well, what we do is we, we create some kind of board to oversee and inspect the quality of these apartments. Uh, so we're going to need some kind of regulatory body. So perhaps you've heard about a rent control board. They're making sure the quality doesn't fall too low. 
If you've been to New York City, you notice the size of uh, apartments and hotels are very small. That's because of these limitations here. All right. Well, what if you could change the name of your product so that you weren't bound by this price ceiling? So have you ever heard of an apartment going co-op, right? So instead of renting from the owner of the building, you are part owner. This is a way to get around rent control because if we don't call it rent, we are not bound by the price ceiling. So we might want to change the name. All right, what else might happen? Well, if we can't charge you more for renting the apartment, perhaps there are other things you need that are not bound by this price control, this price ceiling. For example, you might need a parking spot. And we could tie the price of the parking spot to the rental. So we can't charge you more to rent the apartment. We can max charge you 800 bucks, but we could charge $10,000 for the parking spot. Okay, we could charge more for the parking spot to make up for the fact that we can't charge you more for the rental. How do we determine? Remember, the challenge here is that, oops, demand, supply, the challenge here is that we have this big shortage. So we have lots of people who want to rent, but not enough spaces for them. So how do we decide of all the people looking to rent your apartment, who gets it? Well, we might see bribery. Okay, I'll wax your car, I'll get your groceries. I'll do all these nice things for you if you pick me as your renter. This also leads to discrimination because no longer will the apartment decide who to rent to based on who's willing to pay more, but now they're looking for other criteria to decide who gets these rare few items, remember we want more than there is. So we tend to see more discriminatory practices as people have lots of people they can rent to and only a couple apartments. So the challenges with price ceilings is they lead to bribery, discrimination, they lead to black markets. Okay, so for example, um, we've seen price controls in Venezuela. Let's see if I have, I may not have that article. <clears throat> uh, but Venezuela instituted price controls. They outlawed inflation. They says, businesses, you cannot charge more. We are limiting the price on goods. Well, the problem with this is that people need toilet paper and coffee. And if you set the price, then we know at lower prices, lots of people want to buy, but businesses aren't willing to sell. It's just not viable or profitable for them to be in the business to make coffee. When Venezuela set these price controls, uh, companies like Pepsi left. We're not going to be in this country anymore if we can't charge what it costs to make it plus a bit of a profit. So companies left. Qu the quantity supplied was low. So there's a big shortage. So what happens is black markets emerge. So you go into the grocery store looking for toilet paper and coffee. There's none on the shelf. But you go out back, you're willing to pay someone a premium because the black market is outside of the demand and supply. They can charge whatever price they want because it's an illegal market. They're not bound by this price ceiling. And so bribery, black markets, discrimination emerge when you have price ceilings. People actively try to get around it. Markets like equilibrium. They don't like to be outside of that equilibrium. One more example of um, the impact of a price ceiling. In 1975, the price of oil was restricted to $4 a barrel in the US. They set a price ceiling 
And the idea was the 70s, oil prices were getting really high and people couldn't afford gas. And we need gas to get groceries to the grocery store, people to work. We needed to make our economy run. So the U.S. government put in a price ceiling, demand, supply, at $4 a barrel. Now, this only applied to domestic produced oil. So what they used to do in Texas is they would pull the oil out of the ground in Texas, put it into tanker trucks, drive it across the border to Mexico, turn the truck around, and drive it back across the border. Since the oil was now coming from Mexico, it was no longer bound to that price ceiling, and they could charge more for it. This became so popular that just across the border from Laredo, Texas, in Mexico, in Nuevo Laredo, they built this huge parking lot for tanker trucks to turn around. Because we're always trying to get back to equilibrium. Markets don't like it when they're not in equilibrium. So as we said before, if prices are too high, we can use price ceilings to set a max below that market equilibrium. But it comes with its own downsides, as we have seen. With rent, it means smaller size apartments, poorer quality, more oversight is required, uh, people are trying to change the name or tie it to other products where they can charge more. We also see more bribery, discrimination, and black markets. Trying to get around that shortage that's created by a price ceiling. So you benefit if you are one of those who gets the cheaper apartment, but the downside is there's less apartments available.